be honest, I think sometimes it's bad people doing good deals. Uh, hopefully, I'll demonstrate that today. Um, to kick off with and wake everyone else up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I know it's an afternoon session, I know you had your lunch, so you are welcome to stand. I'm just going to play a quick two-minute video clip. Uh, it's got some African drum beats, so you're welcome to break out in your best African dance also. So that is the Africa that I see happening around us, and that's the Africa that we are trying to help create. Um, there's a lot going on, but a lot still needing to be done. I, um, as I said, so from South Africa. Uh, my name is Chris Rilof, sir. I work for a company that's part of the Standard Bank Group. Most of you probably won't know us, it's because we do business in Africa. That's what we know, that's what we're good at. And that's what gives us presence and knowledge about the market. But I'm not here to market us. I'm here to tell you a bit more about the investment opportunity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time selling you on the Africa story. I think it's been done and it's been oversold many times. What I'm here to tell you today is that there are, even in the absence of growth, existing needs big needs, needs that are um, able to provide good reward because the supply and demand imbalance is so big. Yet there are areas that are growing. There are countries that are growing very well. Um, estimate is that seven of the ten highest growing economies in the world will come from Africa. That's not to say every African country is going to give you good growth. You have to be very selective in where the money goes. The population is also growing. The economic, productive population is growing, thanks to demographics being on the side of the continent. That leads to a growing middle class. It leads to urbanization. And all of that creates a bigger economy, more consumers, bigger demand, and simply the supply is not keeping up to that. And that as what's led to great investment opportunities in our mind. Opportunities such as bridges, power, energy, 
factories, buildings, agriculture. We're also extending into healthcare, education. And I'll be honest with you, when we set out to do what we're doing, and by the way, we are doing this. We've been running a portfolio for more than five years now, investing into these kind of investments in Africa. We didn't set out with a mindset at, at the start of being an impact investor. And that might surprise a lot of you. We set out to say there's a great investment opportunity, a diversifying investment opportunity. How can we best invest in it? And it turned out to be a very complex investment opportunity, very liquid, very long term. And almost without exception, those opportunities, because they were meeting fundamental needs, which is where the reward was coming from, they ended up almost accidentally being impact investments. They ended up being investments that reduce carbon emissions, that create jobs, and therefore every investor can earn his returns, his diversification, and feel good about it. And hence my response earlier to say sometimes it's bad people making good investments, not the other way around. We didn't try and say we the good people will go make some nice investments. We set out with a commercial mandate and almost became impact investors by accident. I'll just quickly show you a few examples to, to make it a little bit more real to you. Um, the first is a, a juice producer. Now, the agriculture sector in the continent, again, hard to invest in, requires a long-term mindset. But think about the opportunity set. You're talking about 60% about of the world's unused arable land in Africa. And even that land that is being farmed is being farmed at, at yields of about a third of the developed world. I imagine the impact it will have to bring technology, skill, training, capital, and what kind of returns can be earned out of that. Not just with the primary agriculture, but then also the packaging, the production, to meet the local consumer demand and to enable exports. It's difficult, but it rewards very well. And agriculture has massively positive impact. It creates jobs, and if you do it right, it can be good for the um, environment as well. And that's maybe a comment I'd like to make on many of these, is in many instances you're creating something out of almost nothing. And therefore you're able to leapfrog developed world. For example, you don't, um, as per the next example, need to go break down a coal station to, pre to go build a, a clean energy station. There is no energy. And the technology is there. So from the start, you go to the correct way of providing energy. Clean energy that's now becoming affordable. And Africa, its resources are not only under the ground, it's got fantastic wind and solar resources. So we invested in about four different wind farms and four different solar plants that make commercial sense and you can feel good about it. This example um, showing experienced IRR today, it's about 40%, and the community benefited. There's conscious efforts for local skill development. So the next solar plant or the next wind farm that props up, you've now got local skills to manage it and to help build it as well. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next two. Other examples are roads, uh, bridges. Um, the infrastructure in the continent is weak. And that's not just the inconvenience, it's a problem for business. If you've got a fresh foods that you're trying to uh, move around the country or export. In the inst an example like the one we've got here, to move your product from one part of the city to another took more than two hours. Build a bridge, that comes down to 15 minutes. You save carbon emissions, you serve a need, you get rewarded for it. Last example, specifically talking to the local consumer need. The, the property bulk simply doesn't exist in the continent. Um, South Africa, uh, where I'm from, has a, in some instances 100 times more property bulk than other countries in the continent. That means that if you're trying to set up office in, in Lagos, Abidjan, the rentals you pay are crazy because the need is so big for office space or rental space for your, for your shop to sell your produce. It's making them uncompetitive. And therefore, if you can provide the property bulk, it gets rewarded again and serves the local market and you can do it in an environmentally conscious manner. 
So where the magic really lies in all of this is if you start putting all of that together, it forms the ecosystem. Every one of those pieces are dependent on the other. You produce the good, you get to transport the good, you get the right kind of energy, you get the telecommunications. We've got some investments into airports, we've got investments into fiber optic cables um, that allows these goods to be exported, to, be com to communicate to the rest of the world. And every one that you add in serves the greater good of the whole ecosystem. They are dependent on one another. And that's the Africa that we try to portray with the, the short video clip in the beginning. So all of that sounds, hopefully, attractive to you. So why isn't everyone invested in it? Few reasons. A lot of reasons, actually, to be honest. Um, you probably all know these investments I'm talking about now. They just not, don't just sit on, this, sit on this shelf. Sorry. Um, they, the capital markets aren't developed. You can't just go and buy a stock that does this stuff for you. I'm hoping in the future there will be, there should be, more of these kind of investments being listed. Currently, the opportunities and the needs are in the, in the private market space. Not uncommon to impact investment. So now you need large minimum investment sizes for one investment, often let's call it $100 million on average. One fund investment, still five to $10 million minimum investment. Then you've got one fund, creates a lot of concentration. Concentration means risk, because some of these projects don't work out. That's the reality of it. But if you can invest in many of them, the concentration risk gets diversified away, and you get to experience the fundamental growth of this economy. But even if you get over that hurdle, through financial engineering, whatever the case may be, you doing business in a continent that's unfortunately known for corruption, for fraud, uh, the governments aren't always doing their bit, how do you know you're not going to get involved in one of those deals by accident? I think that's where the governance layer comes in very important. Is you need a, a professional agent that can monitor, select, oversee these kind of investments for you. And that requires local knowledge. Often, it's the, you know someone who knows someone that can do a reference check for you to know is this a shady deal or not. And those networks in a continent like Africa is very, very important because the data simply isn't there. So that, that, to my mind, explains a lot of why investors aren't going there. It's too much of a hassle, it's too complex, too risky. So you simply don't avoid it. Economy is too small, and I think a lot of people don't realize what great investment opportunities are there because it's simply too much work. So I think there's many solutions required. Um, listing is one I mentioned. We went about it a little bit differently. Um, what we said is you want to get to the private markets, you want to use specialists, experts in their field to go select the individual investments for you, to monitor and manage them for you. But that still is too concentrated and it's too illiquid. If you can take a number of those funds, combine them into a single vehicle, yes, a fund of funds, there's not, nothing new about a fund of funds, there's lots of fund of funds around, but to create enough of them to be diversified in an open-ended format, importantly. So the investor sitting in Europe that says, I've only got $1 million to invest, can say, fine, you write the check, you're in day one, no commitment, drawdown kind of complication, and you've got six months liquidity. Now it becomes a more interesting conversation. Now you have the potential of participating in very, very complex, uh, risky investments with professional management, and there's a whole sector of the investor market that can get included, that currently is excluded by the sheer lack of size and sophistication. And I think um, earlier this morning a few comments were made about the need for solutions. I think there's a lot of great practitioners in this space. There's a lot of great investments, a lot of great needs. What we're struggling to do is to connect the capital to it. And therefore, I think that where a lot of the innovation is required is in creating these solutions that bring them together to make it easier for investors to participate in these kinds of markets. I mentioned that you end up reducing 
risk to a large extent. Now, I'm not going to say it's risk-free. The individual projects are risky. But there's ways to manage the risks through reducing the correlation, through governance, through the way you contract, the legal review of these documents, extremely important. But not everyone has the time or ability to do that. So what does that create? You end up investing in a world where there are fantastic needs, big needs, needs that are so great that they're willing to pay the investors to come meet those needs. Happily, they do so. They benefit from it. Jobs get created. It's good for the environment. And you start seeing an economy that thrives, that feeds one piece feeds off the other in this ecosystem. And in doing so, you end up hitting a lot of social development goals. This is not about trying to target one specific area. It's very specialized. Very, very few investors have the ability or the skill to go pick that one social development goal and exploit it. You need a big portfolio, a lot of sophistication to do that. What we're saying is the opportunities are throughout the spectrum. You need specialists to do it for you. And you need to participate in a big pooled investment so you can get the scale and diversification you require in this continent. So in closing, I'd say you can make money out of impact investing. We are making money out of impact investing. Um, our clients have experienced returns over the f past five years that beat listed equities at lower volatility than bonds, at negative correlation to both those markets. And it's had a massive positive social impact as well. Um, thank you. I'm happy to take questions.